Welcome everyone to the Rotarian and Malaria Partners webinar series. This month is also hosted by Rotarians Against Malaria Global. Thank you everyone again for joining us. My name is Ariel Delaney. I'm the Deputy Director with Rotarian Malaria Partners. This webinar is part of an ongoing series which aims to engage both Rotarians and the malaria prevention community on unique topics of interest made accessible to everyone. The mission of Rotarian Malaria Partners and Rotarians Against Malaria is to engage Rotarians around the globe in the fight to eliminate malaria. Our moderator for today's webinar is Dr. Dorothea Chodu. She is the CEO of Pilgrim Africa, a faith-based organization uh, engaged in malaria control, malaria education and advocacy, and the operational research on malaria control in Uganda, a country with the fourth largest malaria burden in the world. Dorothea is a scientist and a Rotarian. She got her doctorate in physical chemistry from the University of Washington and did modeling work on HIV-1 RNA before attending Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School for a degree in public health. She has been a Rotarian since 2014, a board member of Rotarian Malaria Partners for six years, and remains an active RMP ambassador. During the decade Dorothy has worked at Pilgrim Africa, she has led and shaped the organization's engagement with malaria. Pilgrim Africa specializes in implementing malaria control in rural, highly endemic areas and on discovering best methods of reducing high transmission steeply and cost-effectively. I'll now hand over to Dorothy to continue today's event. Thank you, Ariel. Rotarian Malaria Partners and Rotarians Against Malaria Global are extremely honored to present today's webinar. In addition to its advocacy work in Rotary, Rotarian Malaria Partners is in various stages of training and equipping over 1,700 malaria preventative community health workers in Zambia and Uganda in partnership with their respective country ministries of health. RMP is also supporting malaria public education in the Gambia, indoor residual spraying in Ghana, and several other efforts. Separately, Rotarians Against Malaria is a Rotary International affiliate that has partnered with the Alliance for Malaria Prevention, providing comprehensive training for malaria intervention programs in all 20 sub-Saharan African nations. We had originally planned to bring together the global malaria prevention community in a one-day symposium as part of the Rotary International Convention in Hawaii in early June. However, COVID-19 intervened, and since we had to unfortunately cancel that venue, we asked our symposium participants to bring their knowledge and insight to the malaria prevention community in a different format, virtually, in videos and webinars. Today's webinar is entitled Malaria's Rising Toll in the COVID Shadow, and our speakers today, in alphabetical order, include Dr. Abdurrahman Diallo, Ms. Joy Pumapi, Ms. Diane Stewart, and Dr. Philip Welkoff. Dr. Abdu Rahman Diallo was appointed as the Chief Executive Officer for the RBM Partnership to End Malaria in 2019. The RBM Partnership is the largest global platform for coordinated action towards a world free from malaria. Over 500 partners at all levels, from countries to community health worker associations, comprise this partnership. Abdu brings vast experience and strong skills to this role having worked in leadership positions at national, regional, and global levels on a range of key public health issues. Before joining RBM, Abdu served as Minister of Health for Guinea from 2016 to 2018, dealing with the Ebola crisis and subsequent rebuilding of the national health system. He has also developed health and supply chain systems in more than 20 African, Caribbean, and Asian countries. Abdu is a medical doctor and also holds a master's degree in international public health from Johns Hopkins. Ms. Joy Pumafi is the executive secretary of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance. This is constituted of African Union heads of state and government in order to keep malaria and other diseases high on the political and development agenda. She served both as a member of parliament and as a cabinet minister of health in Botswana during that country's HIV AIDS crisis. She has also served as Vice President for Human Development at the World Bank 
chairs the Independent Accountability Panel for Every Woman, Every Child for the UN Secretary General on Leadership Experience with Global Fund in other capacities, as well as service to UNHCR, World Bank, and recently the Vice Presidency of the AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Drawing on her position and experience at the Global Fund and its role in the COVID-19 response mechanism, Diane will offer us today the latest thinking on how global donors are prioritizing funding to strengthen health systems and essential health services, including malaria preventative and treatment efforts across all the partner countries. Finally, we have Dr. Philip Welkoff, Malaria Director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation believes that all lives have equal value and this drives their work to end inequity. Before coming to lead the malaria team, Philip served as director of research at the Institute for Disease Modeling. There, he helped develop computer simulations of malaria, polio, and other disease transmission dynamics to assist in planning the eradication of different diseases. In 2009, Philip received a Special Achievement Award by a Hertz Fellow for his work on malaria modeling. He holds dual undergraduate degrees in mathematics and aerospace engineering, together with a PhD in applied and computational mathematics from Princeton University. I'll now hand over to our star-studded lineup to open our conversation today. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, everybody, and um, how wonderful to speak to you all today. Um, thank you to the Rotarians for this opportunity. I'd like to um, start with perhaps the, the optimistic moment um, that we had in January this year, where the Global Fund, coming out of a very successful replenishment last year, was gearing up to really step up the fight against malaria. We were expecting to invest up to 23% more financing in our program, starting with for the next grant cycle, um, with 32% of this new $14 billion that we had raised going in the fight against malaria. So we were very excited and um, fully expecting to get back on track towards ending malaria by 2030. And then of course came COVID-19 and everything changed. The direct impact of COVID-19 is scary enough with over half a million deaths so far um, and nearly 13 million infections globally. But making it worse is the knock-on impact that we're seeing um, throughout other health programs. COVID-19 is derailing the fight against malaria in a number of ways. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the recent WHO modeling that shows that malaria deaths could more than double in sub-Saharan Africa in 2020 as a result of COVID-19, meaning that malaria deaths would revert to the same level as, the, as 2000, as 20 years ago, effectively wiping out all of the gains that we have made in the last two decades. And essentially rendering useless the $13.2 billion that the Global Fund has invested in malaria since that time. So it's staggering to think about what we stand to lose. My fellow panelists today, I'm sure, are, are much better placed uh, to speak about the challenges at the country level. Um, but the Global Fund is already seeing a kind of aggregate impact um, in the programs that we have. We've been doing regular check-in surveys um, in, in, across our portfolio. And in 73% of the countries we've surveyed, um, they're reporting between moderate, high, and very high disruption to malaria programs across the portfolio. We saw a slight improvement of this in, in recent weeks as uh, governments and partners have uh, reoriented their work to try and um, ensure malaria service delivery, but the situation remains extremely volatile. So we as a partnership have reacted very quickly to that. We made up to $1 billion available for adaptation to um, programs so that we could think about what we could do better. Um, and we've quickly deployed this funding to help countries mitigate the risk of malaria programs. Um, what that looks like is, for example, um, in a bed net campaign, mobilizing um, significantly more community health workers um, in the case of Benin, for example, we had to mobilize an additional 5,000 community health workers to go door to door to distribute uh, more than 8 million malaria nets across the country in just 20 days. That costs money, 
that means that in addition to the investments we've already made for that for that program, we had to add additional money to do the training um, and to make it possible for those community health workers to go out. Um, we've seen similar um, issues with malaria um, rapid diagnostic tests, where we had major disruptions to um, some of the supply chain issues. And we're also seeing additional costs in um, community outreach programs, both for community health workers and um, for uh, the uh, kind of communication mechanisms that we need to put in place um, for the malaria program. We're, we're, so what we're trying to do is work to also make malaria um, be classified as an essential service so that we can secure commodities, um, the PPE and other things available for the health workers that we see are just not getting to the people who need them right now. As the Global Fund, we've made about $70 million available for PPE already in the last month, um, and we've just concluded a new agreement with UNICEF to try and make that protective gear available for all health workers so that the bed net campaigns and other things can ramp up. But the point I want to make today um, is that we can't have business as usual in the face of COVID-19. It's just not going to work. The extraordinary situation is going to require an extraordinary response. We've estimated that in order to make sure that these programs can continue across AIDS, TB, and malaria, probably countries need about $28.5 billion just in the next 12 months. Of that, we think the Global Fund should be able to um, channel about $5 billion. That is a huge amount of money. It's basically um, a whole investment of, um, of, of our annual budget, um, once again, 100% increase. And so we have to think really about where that money is going to come from. And what we're seeing is that traditional ODA budgets, traditional health budgets, um, domestic resources are not capable of stepping up to the level of need to adapt the programs um, in country um, and to make sure that these things can continue. So what we're doing is reaching out to all of our partners, public and private, to say we have to step up significantly to raise this money. And I think this is something where um, Rotarians who have, have stood together so, so uh, strongly with the global community to fight polio need to think about how do we scale up this, this um, fight for, for malaria. Um, what we don't want to see is residual um, uh, pandemics only in poor countries um, where um, rich countries have already eliminated them. And we, we know that that is already the case with malaria, AIDS, and tuberculosis. And we're seeing this also as a possibility for COVID. So what we're saying is we need to step up now. We need to invest um, in programs alongside our, our existing pandemic response, build on that response to fight COVID, and ensure that the COVID investments don't derail funding for AIDS, TB, and malaria. And I think this is particularly um, relevant for malaria because we had such high hopes for el the elimination program this year. Um, and for the Global Fund, what we're seeing and what we've managed to do with many of the bed net campaigns is to invest additional money to get them back on track so that we can, in fact, um, keep those targets in sight. But my plea today and what I hope we can discuss um, in the Q&A is that really um, to protect those gains that we've made over the last 20 years, we're going to need to double our efforts. That means doub doubling the efforts um, on programming in countries, um, put, making sure that we can protect our frontline health workers to do that and raising significantly more money to invest um, in the malaria program um, to make sure that we not only protect the gains we've made, but get back on track towards elimination. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity to share with you our experience on the African continent. Rotarians are a very important stakeholder. And indeed, uh, in 2017, when the Africa CDC was established to strengthen the continent's health capacity to detect and respond quickly and effectively to disease threats and outbreaks, we were very, very optimistic, particularly as uh, five uh, uh, collaborating centers were set up amongst the AU regions. And, um, and, and uh, we, we, we had an opportunity, therefore, to be ready for the next big pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, when COVID-19 uh, hit this year, we, we, we were not yet uh, fully operational in terms of um, uh, catching up with international health regulations. And specifically from, mal from malaria, we've already heard from Diane what the impact has been on the continent and the potential impact 
according to the, the modeling that was done by WHO. So what we have been doing now is, is uh, supporting countries to learn first from uh, the countries that have actually been um, continuing with the, with the malaria uh, interventions, uh, like uh, Benin, which was the first one to practice the the dot to dot distribution of, 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 of nets uh, that was being described by Diane. But uh, in addition to that, we, 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 our chair, first of all, the chair of, 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 uh, of ARMA, that is His Excellency President Kenyatta, wrote in March when we saw that the pandemic was, was really beginning to hit Africa and uh, things, and uh, we, there was a threat that. Uh, traditional health services would be impacted, including malaria. He wrote to every single head of state and asked them to make sure that uh, they continue the, 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 the malaria uh, interventions, whether they be the, the vector control, uh, early diagnosis treatment. Um, and all the heads of state responded that they would do their best. And um, so this has actually made it easier when development partners, when us as, a, as, as ALMA, when a RBM goes to countries and says, don't let the malaria services suffer. Uh, this has actually helped a lot. Uh, the modifying of the distribution has been adopted by countries like Guinea Bissau, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, and uh, which have since com completed their campaigns, DRC, Niger, Chad, South, South Sudan, Mali, Uganda, Central African Republic are rolling out their campaigns. So you can, you can see that um, uh, the combination of the existence of the Africa CDC, which is aiding countries uh, to, to appreciate that it is not just about malaria, uh, it's not just about COVID, but uh, the other infectious diseases that currently exist, and the uh, intervention of, um, of, of, of the, the chair of ARMA, and the appointment by a, a, of, a, of a team by His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa of four special envoys to mobilize international support for Africa's efforts to address the economic impact, social impact of, 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 a, of COVID. These are all having a combined effect. Now we as ARMA uh, work as an RBM partner to support countries. Uh, whether uh, uh, an advocate for what the Sahel is doing now with seasonal malaria chemo prevention, sustaining case management, urging countries to learn from Rwanda. Rwanda. Rwanda is actually doing it at community level and to emulate that, learn from what Zambia is doing, which has been guiding health facilities to set up more clinic days in a, in a week to avoid over, overcrowding of under five clinics and identifying spaces where clinics could be held away from those that may be suffering from COVID-19. So we are urging countries to learn from one another, to copy one another and to, and, and, and to continue to sustain services. Uh, but uh, one of the, the, the things that we are continuing to do, which is, up, which is proving to be absolutely critical at this point, is uh, encouraging countries to continue pro to produce uh, scorecards, the national scorecards, scorecards which have got indicators which which uh, capture the surveillance data, uh, which are able to identify the bottlenecks and the interruptions in the services. And, uh, and, and, and we continue to do the support strengthening of these scorecards. We have, we have, um, we have de 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 developed uh, uh, models that can ex uh, enable us to do this uh, electronically uh, without, uh, without uh, actually visiting the countries. We are supporting countries to establish national malaria councils to create a multi-stakeholder engagement, cross-sectoral engagement by the whole society, the ownership, and, uh, and, uh, and also to support countries to establish end malaria funds within the countries that will tap uh, domestic uh, private sector resources and also resources from international partners which are not going through the traditional uh, um, the traditional uh, resource flows such as uh, the World Bank and the, and the Global Fund. And we are also establishing a youth engagement mechanism to ensure sustainability and institutionalization of the fight against malaria. And these are all areas where we would welcome Rotarians to partner with us. We are already working with Rotary in, in Zambia, in the End Malaria Council in Zambia. And uh, it is proving to be a very, very effective partner with the, uh, the Rotarians there. 
and it will be extremely useful if Rotarians could actually engage in the other countries as well, where we are establishing national uh, and malaria councils and funds. We believe that um, as uh, malaria partners, uh, we have a responsibility, like Diane was saying, to avoid an increase in malaria cases and deaths and remain on track to defeat malaria once and for all. Because if we, we don't, the malaria challenge can become overwhelming. And uh, we, have, we have been able over the years to actually reduce this, prove that we can reduce it and, uh, and turn it into a manageable uh, a challenge which we can ultimately defeat. And uh, we, we believe that uh, this is a call, this uh, should stand as a clarion call to all of us, that uh, zero malaria starts with me, but it also starts with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, everyone. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It is a real pleasure for me to be part of uh, these important discussions. Um, as you said at the beginning, the RBM partnership is the largest platform for coordinated action against, uh, against malaria. And what we do is articulated around three major pillars. The first one being uh, keeping malaria very high on the political and the, the development agenda to make sure that malaria doesn't fall off the screen, uh, which uh, unfortunately tends to, to, to happen. We also work on, on promoting and supporting regional approaches in the fight against, uh, against malaria. And we advocate for uh, sustained uh, financing for uh, the fight against uh, malaria. As we heard from uh, both the Global Fund and, and Alma, uh, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a worrisome repercussions on the fight against uh, malaria. I think um, the result of the WHO's modeling speaks eloquently on what we are all facing if we're, we're not care careful. I think um, Diane shared some numbers there. Um, unfortunately, in the worst case scenario, we could be doubling the number of deaths, uh, reaching nearly 800,000 uh, deaths a year, which is uh, which would be a catastrophe. And I, I hope we really don't don't uh, reach that point. So, what is RBM uh, doing to to respond to to that challenge? So, we basically put out three calls to action. The first call to action is to maintain all malaria prevention campaigns. As you know, um, there are various interventions that are planned in, in different countries. So um, interventions such as distribution of uh, LLINs, uh, indoor residual spray, as uh, uh, Joy mentioned, um, seasonal malaria chemo prevention and so on. And at the beginning of the pandemic, what was happening was those interventions were either being uh, delayed or canceled in some cases. Um, we, we worked with partners, especially Alma, to reach out to all those countries. And the good news is um, many countries heard the call and uh, favorably responded um, to, to, to it. We heard uh, from, from Joy that uh, Benin, Guinea-Bissau, and Sierra Leone have already completed their, their uh, LLI and distribution campaigns, and there are other countries that have their campaigns uh, uh, underway. And uh, with all that, uh, the idea is to make sure that countries not only uh, carry out those interventions, but they adapt uh, the delivery of those services to the COVID-19 response. Um, we would partners uh, put out uh, guidelines on how to carry out those interventions under COVID-19. Um, so that's a helpful tool in making sure that um, PPEs are, uh, are available to community health workers in their distribution activities, making sure that social distancing recommendations are, are also followed. The second call to action is to keep the malaria supply chain functioning. And I think um, Diane also uh, uh, touched on that. It is fundamental to make sure that the global malaria supply chain functions very well to ensure continuous availability of quality uh, malaria products. And that requires an international cooperation between manufacturers, donors, uh, recipient countries, 
uh, advocacy partners and and so on it is it is a major industry thing to make sure that um, there is no sort shortage of uh, key essential malaria commodities the third call uh, to action there is to to maintain essential health services what tends to happen is uh, when the, the global community when the world faces uh, an emergency the tendency is to to forget uh, diseases that have been around uh, for uh, centuries, basically, to forget these other killers. As a former minister of health of a country that dealt uh, with uh, with Ebola, I know exactly what happened uh, with Ebola. Overall, health services um, were reduced by roughly 50%. Hospital frequentation uh, at hospital attendance was significantly reduced. Deliveries were no longer being assisted uh, for women. The immunization programs suffered. And for programs such as TB, the number of lost to follow up patients dramatically uh, increased. And uh, care seeking habits basically just went away uh, within the community. So it is fundamental to make sure that we don't go back to previous numbers that were uh, uh, mentioned uh, by the, the previous uh, presenters. It's fundamental to make sure that there is capacity out there to care for uh, people who would uh, need diagnosis, people who would need care, and also for preventive services to be properly uh, uh, carried out. I just would like to uh, mention in addition to that, that we are also, we've been also working with donor countries and financing institutions to make sure that the increased malaria funding needs created by the COVID-19 pandemic are not only addressed, but also um, the additional funding that is required to put malaria back on track uh, are also mobilized. So in a nutshell, that's uh, what RBN has been uh, working on with all the partners that are actually uh, on this uh, on this panel. With that said, I would like to, to say quickly a few words on how uh, the Rotarians could actually uh, join that effort. Uh, we believe that there is a great opportunity to, to work with the Rotarians on the calls to actions that I just uh, uh, mentioned. We share with the Rotarians uh, this common goal of uh, eradicating malaria. And uh, we believe that a, a global civil society network such as the Rotarians could play a tremendous role in, um, in, in making sure that those calls are properly heard, in making sure that malaria doesn't fall off the screen, that um, the, the leaders of this world, so that uh, people with the, the money, the decision makers, the policy makers, uh, continue to, to keep uh, malaria very, very high on their agenda, and also contribute to mobilizing the, all the resources that are needed to, to step up the fight against malaria. And I mean by that financial resources and, uh, and human uh, resources. We've been working also on, uh, on supporting countries in, in their advocacy and resource mobilization effort through uh, the Zero Malaria Start With Me campaign that uh, Joy just mentioned, that uh, was launched by the heads of states uh, back in 2018 at the African Union Summit. So that campaign is specifically designed to make sure, again, as I mentioned earlier, that really malaria doesn't fall off the screen. To make sure that the financial resources that are required to fight uh, malaria are mobilized through innovative uh, uh, sources of funding. Calling on the private sector, uh, for instance, and diversifying the, the, the different sources of funding uh, and so on. And the third important uh, piece of that campaign is uh, to build ownership within the communities. The communities have to take ownership of the fight against malaria uh, and also uh, hold their leaders accountable for the different commitments that they made to, to, fight, uh, to, to fight malaria. So since the launch of that campaign, 15 countries have uh, 
uh, interestingly implemented that that campaign. That campaign. Uh, the last one we did it in, in March. It was Rwanda. So uh, it is a campaign that is really gaining a lot of attention, a lot of uh, momentum. Uh, earlier in the month, on July 2nd, we celebrated the, the second anniversary of the launch of the campaign. And at the same time, we launched a great initiative called the Zero Malaria Business uh, Leadership Initiative, which is a partnership between um, uh, RBM and the Pan-African Commercial Bank called EcoBank that is present in uh, many African countries uh, and Speak Up Africa, which is um, uh, a strategic communication and advocacy uh, firm, obviously uh, under the, the very caring eyes and leadership of the African Union, uh, including uh, ALMA. So we're very proud uh, of that initiative because it is the first time that we're able to invite what I called uh, the non-traditional private sector uh, to the fight against malaria. So traditionally, it is uh, the, the industry, the private sector that is very close to the health sector that is associated to the fight against malaria, but to reach out to commercial banks, um, I think uh, it is a great step towards um, bringing more uh, other private sector entities to, to the fight against malaria. Hopefully the oil and gas sector, the telecom sector and, and so on will, uh, will uh, definitely join uh, uh, that fight. Uh, it, it would definitely help uh, to have those private sector institutions be involved because they can not only protect their employees in the environment uh, where they work in, but they can also uh, protect the, the, the populations within that very same uh, environment, not to mention uh, what that means for decision makers, leaders, and, and politicians in terms of really stimulating them, encouraging them to, to join uh, that, that initiative. So uh, with, with, with that said, uh, definitely Rotarians, uh, uh, could uh, join all those uh, initiatives and, and, and help in uh, rolling out the Zero Malaria uh, Start With Me campaign in, in, in different countries, considering that it is a global network that is present throughout the world and expanded further beyond the, the, the African uh, continent and, and reach out to, to other countries. So we extend a very warm invitation to Rotarians to, to partner with all of us. In, and in supporting these uh, these efforts, we learned a lot from uh, the Rotarians' effort in um, in uh, in the fight against polio. So we saw uh, how that significantly contributed to strengthening overall health systems and also the dividend that that represented to to those countries. So. Uh, Again, just as a last call, uh, I always say this, uh, I continue to be frustrated. Malaria is just not something that I read about. I experienced malaria many, many, many times and my country of origin uh, is an endemic uh, country. It is really frustrating to see a disease that old to continue to, to kill uh, more than, than 400,000 people every year. and. We continue to have over 200 million cases uh, every year, not to mention that it continues to be a disease of poverty. Uh, it is the most vulnerable people under five years, children and pregnant women that continue to pay the heaviest toll of, of this disease. It, it, is, it is not uh, acceptable, not to mention the, the situation that we are all facing with COVID-19. So this new emergency shouldn't make us forget about these other diseases that have been uh, killing so many people. So it is time for all of us to get together, put our hands together, put our shoulders to the wheel and make sure that we reach our global goal of eliminating malaria by 2030. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to uh, Dorothy and uh, my uh, colleagues on this panel. And uh, a special thanks to Rotarian Malaria Partners who have been uh, uh, close partners of us 
uh, at the Gates Foundation on our work on uh, case management, community engagement, uh, a key part of some uh, very exciting progress being made in Zambia and Uganda, um, and also uh, uh, hosting this webinar series. I think uh, getting to malaria eradication and responding to malaria in this moment of the COVID outbreak will take innovation, it'll take partnership, it'll take adaptability. And I think uh, uh, pulling off this uh, whole webinar series is a great example of all three of those things. Um, at the Gates Foundation, we are, are uh, committed to uh, uh, addressing these diseases that uh, we, we don't think anyone should be dying of diseases that are preventable, treatable, solvable, eradicable. And I think uh, when we think about polio and malaria, these are two diseases that are um, incredible symptoms of the uh, inequality that exists. And that's why uh, first with polio and now with malaria, uh, the eradication of these diseases has been a, a, a top priority for us as a, as a Gates Foundation. Um, and in this, we've been very um, uh, fortunate and, 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 and honored to be able to partner with Rotary. Um, Rotary has a, a strong uh, legacy of leadership in this global space and addressing uh, needs that that um, that of, of those uh, uh, where health has not improved as much as as it should. Uh, Rotary for over three decades has been leading the fight for the eradication of polio. And uh, we're now on the cusp of, of, of accomplishing that. I think it's been wonderful now in recent years for the close collaboration and partnership on addressing malaria. If we look at what's required to achieve malaria eradication, um, we need good case management. We need good community engagement. And these need to be undergirded by strong political will to finish the job and the funding needed to get there. And I think in all of these areas, we've seen uh, first with polio and now starting with ma malaria, Rotarians in their communities in and around the world are a leading and a great example for us and great partners for us. Um, any great task requires partnership. And that's why we're um, uh, very happy to be able to work with Global Fund, with RBM Partnership, with Alma, with uh, Rotary. And I think um, this uh, partnership will help respond to, to this current crisis and get all the way to a world free of malaria. Um, I think we should take a moment just to recognize how far we've come in the fight against malaria. Um, over the course of the past 17 years or so, an increase in funding, deployment of new tools such as long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets, a switch to artemisinin combination therapies, uh, use of rapid diagnostic tests, um, have driven down malaria burden uh, to unprecedentedly low levels. Um, right now, um, uh, from close to a million deaths a year, it's gone down to uh, a, a bit over 400,000 deaths. So this is great progress um, every year, thanks to the actions of, of, the, of the partnerships. Um, over half a million lives get saved every single year re re relative to what would be happening otherwise. That's good news on the one hand, but it's also, um, it also rec we also recognize that there are still over 400,000 deaths that happen every year from a disease that is preventable, treatable, curable. There's all kinds of um, discussion right now about the search for, for a cure for COVID, uh, the search for diagnostics, the search for ways of preventing deaths. And we have uh, treatments for malaria. We have the diagnostics. No one should be dying of this disease. And yet over 400,000 die every year. And not only that, but this progress, uh, this big reduction, this cutting in half of malaria deaths only happens because of the strong continued work every year. It, does, it didn't just happen uh, naturally and it's not locked in. And whenever there's disruptions to the work that can happen, we see the risk of a major reversal. We see what happened uh, with the Ebola outbreak as uh, Dr. Diallo uh, referenced, where um, with disruptions to health services and uh, endemic diseases like malaria, uh, killed far more people uh, than Ebola during the outbreak. And uh, we are at risk of seeing that happen again. Uh, Diane and uh, Dr. Diallo have, refer uh, have referred to the modeling that was done. And I think uh, we, can, we see that uh, when these activities, which are saving so many lives every year, are disrupted, when the nets are not distributed, 
when access to effective case management breaks down, uh, we, we, we see deaths happen. So um, we, there is a great uh, need to respond in this current moment. And uh, I've been very grateful to see the strong and urgent actions taken by ALMA, by RBM, by the Global Fund. This call to action, the work on maintaining the work that's needed, responding to the crisis, and uh, uh, making sure that the funding supply chains and activities that um, have saved many lives and are needed desperately to save lives this year uh, uh, will continue and even be enhanced. When we look forward, though, we saw with Ebola, we're seeing now with COVID, that malaria is unforgiving. It rises very rapidly. Um, it, uh, it devastates communities. It's preventable and treatable, but if not prevented and if not treated, it's deadly and it's devastating. We don't want to see the world be in a place where anytime something goes wrong, when there's a crisis, when there's an outbreak, when there's a pandemic, that malaria swoops in and kills the most vulnerable. And that's why coming out of this response uh, to the, uh, this moment of the COVID pandemic, a continued push all the way to a world free of malaria is essential. Um, and I think it will take uh, partnership, it will take the innovation, it will take really strong case management and community engagement. And uh, that's why I'm uh, very grateful for the partnership with Rotary and Rotarians that has existed to date and looking forward to the next steps in our work together. Thank you. Thank you all for that incredibly rich set of remarks. Uh, I'd like to follow up with a few questions for the panelists. Uh, this first question really is for any one of you. Um, Philip, you've just talked very movingly about the fact that malaria does still claim 400, over 400,000 lives a year and struggles a bit to raise four to $5 billion a year to fight the disease. But COVID in the last few months has garnered trillions of dollars from the developed world, essentially a thousand times as much money. Uh, so for all of you, for the whole panel, why the disconnect and what can we do about it? It is a, a very interesting question. Like I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, malaria has been around longer than the humanity. Uh, but what tends to happen, and I, I, I always talk about this, is uh, malaria tends to be uh, normalized complacency. People have, over the years, over the decades, accepted malaria. I anecdotally always say, but it is, in fact, true. In many countries, when someone is expected to attend a meeting, and uh, the person doesn't show, um, show up and they ask where is so and so and they say oh so and so is unfortunately not feeling well oh what does the person have oh it's malaria in many countries oh okay okay i thought it was something serious that tends to be uh, the, the 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 response unfortunately people don't want you around uh, besides covid 19 people don't want you around if you're coughing if you're sneezing if your, you know, your nose is, uh, is, is, you have runny nose and so on, because they just, if they're afraid to catch something, they would worry more about that than just saying, oh, someone has malaria. And that goes uh, to the highest level of leadership. People tend to, to normalize malaria and take it for, uh, take it for, I would say, just uh, uh, something to, to, to live with. Um, it is sad to see um, that every time the global community, the world faces a new challenge, a new threat, that that threat tends to uh, supersede, to, to have priority over the over the, the the fight of the endemic diseases, and we shouldn't let that happen. I think the numbers are sufficiently eloquent. Is sufficiently speak for uh, what needs to, to happen. We shouldn't let that happen. We should really step up the fight and make sure that is uh, reversed. As Philip said, we have all the tools. We have tools that work across the board. All we need to do is to uh, strengthen the advocacy, make sure that some of the things that we should all talked about here really, really happen. Can I just add there that um, I think an important thing is that Malaria is a disease of the poor. You look at malaria, you look at neglected tropical diseases, you, need, you look at uh, HIV AIDS, you, need at, you look at tuberculosis, especially multi-drug resistance and XDR-TB, 
these are all diseases of the poor. And uh, malaria was actually eliminated in the rich countries, mid-century, last, last century. So, so it is because it is a disease of the poor that it is not prioritized. COVID is affecting everybody, it's killing everyone. Whether you are rich or poor, it, it affects everybody. And it's, it's affecting the, the globe across the, 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 the economic divide. That is why it is a priority. So in short, that is the reason. Uh, the, the, the reason that, that uh, my brother, um, uh, Dr. Diallo is giving, yes, that is how it is treated in Africa. But globally, it is because it's a, it's, it belongs, it's a disease of the poor countries. That is why it is neglected. Yeah, and maybe just to, to add to that, I think that what's important to realize as well, yes, indeed, trillions have been mobilized for COVID, but those trillions are for, for advanced economies. That money is going to rich countries. That money is not going to address COVID in low and middle income countries where malaria is endemic. So we, we have a challenge on our hands also with the fight for COVID. And, that, and that's why at the Global Fund, we're saying we, we actually have to address COVID as part of our way of mitigating the impact on malaria. Because um, the, the, um, the, the challenge is both to get more resources for malaria, but also resources for COVID in low and middle income countries. Because all of that money that you're seeing mobilized, I can assure you, is not going um, to countries uh, that, that, that are the poorest and are the starting to see the impact of COVID now. So I think our challenge is going to be to make sure that, the, that all of this infrastructure that we've worked so hard to build around community health workers, around our supply chains, all of those things that, that um, uh, uh, my fellow panelists have explained so eloquently, we have to protect those and also make sure that they are the delivery vehicles also for COVID so that we do these things at the same time and we don't end up with COVID as just another disease in poor countries after it's eliminated in the advanced economies because of all the trillions of dollars. Um, and we're seeing the same issues around equity of distribution um, of, of therapies and testing and all of those things that we see um, uh, it playing out also in, uh, in the pandemics that we're already trying to address. So I think that there are some fundamental systemic issues here around inequity that are that are really being exposed by the, the COVID pandemic. And we have an opportunity to address those as well as we are having this conversation to make sure that, you know, the, the, as uh, I think uh, Philippe was saying, because it's the, it's the Gates Foundation motto that all labs are equal. And so um, we, we should be taking care um, of every of everybody and making sure that everybody has access to the kinds of services they need and this is an opportunity finally and um, we've, we've certainly got the attention of the world um, on infectious diseases so we absolutely we we have to um, we have to use the opportunity to try and have a different conversation about how money flows to health systems yes yeah, thank you all and and diane i might just follow up a little bit um because i see that some of our attendees are are asking um, you and other panelists shared a lot of rich information about the kinds of malaria interventions that are being interrupted by COVID-19 and how that's impacting the economics of those interventions. I wonder if you could just take a few minutes to talk about that with a particular country example, um, going through something like a bed net distribution a little bit more in detail and, and showing us how that's uh, how that's happening. And then um, also, if you could say a little bit about how partners are helping countries implement COVID-19 guidelines right now, and maybe what African countries are doing about COVID-19. Um, so maybe I'll give a few examples, and, and I know um, that Abdu and, and indeed Joy also have a, a lot of knowledge about what's happening. Um, across the board. We, we primarily have some um, information coming in from Africa. Um, I think the, the example I, I gave from Benin is, is significant because of the scale. So that was a bed net distribution campaign um, that was they were desperately trying to get in before the rainy season. And we were worried that it was going to be completely canceled. And I mean, it's obviously significant, the country is endemic and so on. And so what, what that needed was financing to, to be able to actually do social distancing bed net distribution. So normally when you do a bed net distribution, you know, one or two workers, community health workers, go to the middle of the village, they stand there by a, a stand, they, they distribute the bed nets there, and people come to them 
on market day, um, uh, and, and that's how the distribution is done. So to flip that around and do door-to-door -door bed net distribution, so that requires additional motorbikes, it requires PPE for all of these additional 5,500 community health workers, additional. That means they all needed um, masks, they all needed protective gear, they all needed um, transport to go door to door in all of the villages throughout the country. Um, and that was an 8 million bed net um, distribution program um, that was still managed to be completed in eight days. But that gives you a sense of the scale of what it takes to turn um, a campaign on its head. Um, the, so the so the door to door distribution has been a huge um, change of of modality. Um, I think the other big piece that we're investing in right now, as I said, part of part of this is um, around making sure that malaria is seen as one of the essential programs in a country, because that's how um, to the points that others have been making. That's how they make sure that they're also in line to get PPE and other things so that they can do those things. Um, and, and what we're seeing as part of that is a big need, and we've invested in this from Cameroon to Mozambique, um, uh, is that the community information um, programs. So usually we do that kind of outreach around malaria. You know if your child has a fever, you need to take them to the hospital and so on. We've had to adapt all of those outreach and communication and information programs to explain that the, that the fever could also be COVID. Um, and, and to still encourage people to, to seek help and to seek uh, um, uh, medical professionals. Because a lot of um, people are now afraid to go anywhere near health centers because they're afraid of COVID and because some of those health centers are already dealing with COVID. Um, and so indeed, um, there's, a, there's a lot of information and, and community trust that has to be built up. And it's something that actually has been a huge success of malaria programs over the last couple of decades has been that community trust, that information sharing, um, and the, the um, trust that uh, community members have in their health uh, workers. And what we're seeing at risk now is that, like in Ebola, the health workers are starting to be seen as the vectors of transmission of COVID. And so that trust is being undermined. Um, and so th those are some of the things where we're having to invest hugely to try and make sure that we don't have a complete um, breakdown of that frontline system with lack of confidence of the communities um, and, and lack of protection for, for health workers. Thank you very much. Would, would other panelists like to add to that? The, the challenges that we have had, we have had huge challenges in terms of stock outs and um, and uh, we have found that countries are actually willing to support one another. Partners have supported one another. We have had uh, medicines, uh, uh, stocks being airlifted from one country to another. Um, these, these are, these, these, this is something that would not norm, normally happen. Um, when uh, India uh, announced that it was going to only be manufacturing essential uh, 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 medicines, uh, President uh, Kenyatta, as the chair of ARMA, um, actually spoke to President Modi and asked him that malaria be included amongst the reserved commodities, and that they should uh, they should they should they, 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 the the commodities should be transported out. They should not block the transportation of uh, of malaria products. Um, we 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 had we 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 knew that there was a commitment coming from the World Bank to finance a huge uh, malaria pro, pro program in in Nigeria. And uh, we knew that uh, with COVID-19, there's a potential that is going to be blocked. So to be preemptive, um, President Kenyatta actually wrote to the president of the World Bank to ask them that uh, they, they, they must keep malaria uh, funding as a priority uh, amongst the, 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 the IDA projects that have been funded and also the, 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 the grants, particularly um, the, the special grants that were being established. So, so we, we, we I just wanted to, to give those examples that uh, sometimes you have to be preemptive, but sometimes even after the effect, uh, countries are really collaborating and working together. Great, thank you. I actually have a follow-up question for you. Since ALMA is focused on galvanizing African national leaders in the fight against malaria, and you've provided a really wonderful example of that, how that works, um, just to, just to ask you, how can civil society organizations like Rotary and Rotary International help with the work that you're trying to do? Yeah, we, 
we, we, we, we feel that uh, Rotary and you know, civil society can actually play a critical role. Uh, I think I, um, in my very you know, quick uh, presentation, I talked about the end malaria councils. And malaria councils are actually uh, multi-stakeholder uh, councils, forums, which, uh, which, which uh, bring all the stakeholders together, private sector, civil society, uh, uh, different government sectors, donors, uh, government, uh, around the table so that they can they can they can deal with the malaria challenge together and resolve it and they use um, a, a, the, the the scorecard as an information piece to 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 galvanize action to be able to 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 keep track of what is happening in the fight against malaria to identify the bottlenecks and to collectively agree on how they are going to resolve uh, this bottlenecks and uh, a, a good example of where this is working extremely well uh, they actually, uh, before COVID hit, they, was, they started establishing a malaria fund, and then malaria fund is Zambia. And uh, Zambia is one country where Rotary is extremely active in malaria, and automatically it has become a partner in the council and in the mobilization of resources. Now, we, now we are establishing these councils in different African countries, um, we, we like uh, Mozambique, like uh, uh, Eswatini, because they were the, the, the outgoing chair, Kenya, uh, Ghana. So there are lots of countries that are in the process of establishing this. Uh, this uh, and today we just spoke with a with a with a minister of health together with uh, my brother Abdu, who 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 has agreed that the council will be set up. Uganda is another country. So these in these countries would be very very uh, keen to work with Rotary uh, uh, partners. Uh, as members of as, as uh, members of the business community, the civil society community, uh, to 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 promote the work of the council, but also in the resource mobilization. And the resource mobilization is not just domestic, but it's also external. Thank you, um, Abdu. Maybe you could also say a few words about uh, more from an international perspective uh, about how you are partnering with Rotary and other. Uh, non-traditional international sources of, of money. We've heard a lot about how malaria is a disease of the poor and how resource mobilization directed towards developed nations is easier than resource mobilization directed towards developing nations. If you could just share a few words with us about um, how you are partnering and hope to partner in the future. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you, you, you just... Uh... Uh, touched on a point that is uh, very dear to me because I keep hearing uh, a lot about um, uh, pushing for domestic mobilization. Yes, it can happen, of course, um, through public-private partnership. Uh, I, I just mentioned in my presentation and the initiative that we launched uh, in the, uh, on July second uh, with uh, EcoBank, which is a, a Pan-African uh, uh, commercial bank. Uh, which is a way to really bring uh, the private sector to the table and, and favorize, uh, favorize the, uh, domestic mo resource mobilization. If we're not innovative, if we don't think about such approaches, we run into a serious problem because uh, developing countries do not have the, the right uh, fiscal space to allocate funding, appropriate level of funding to the fight against malaria. If you sit in national budget arbitration, you'll see challenges that countries go through. The proportion, if you look at within the continent, especially um, in West Africa, you look at the proportion of the national budget that is allocated to the health sector itself, only a few countries would really hit 10% uh, and above. Most countries are, are below. That is why we actively work with um, uh, donor countries, with uh, global funding institutions to make sure that um, resources are uh, mobilized not only to step up the fight against malaria, but to make sure that also in the current context of COVID-19, that the repercussion of the pandemic on malaria uh, that generated uh, additional needs for funding are taken care of. With uh, my sister Joy here, we reached out to the, to the World Bank and uh, talked about uh, many options that, that reduction, uh, specific funding allocate, uh, allocation for the fight against malaria. We've been talking also uh, closely to some uh, donor countries. 
uh, where we share the challenges that uh, different countries are going through and uh, obviously with the traditional donors as well. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, Philip, I'd like to ask you a question about sort of the future. Recently, as you described, we've made great progress with, with insecticide-treated nets, with indoor residual spraying, and with artemisinin and combination therapies. Yet many are concerned that these are losing effectiveness or are not enough. What new tools or systems do you feel hold the most promise for the future of malaria control? And what is needed to make them a success? Right. Uh, th thanks, Dorothy. Um, I, I think uh, there's three main uh, pieces that I would just like to mention here. The first one is we need continued innovation to keep these types of tools working. We know that whenever we exert pressure on the, the disease, that we see uh, the evolution of resistance. And so I think a lot of continued innovation to keep uh, the uh, current forms of vector control and the current current treatments and diagnostics, uh, forms of uh, diagnostics and drugs working is gonna be key. So I think there's needed investments that are happening in the next generation of diagnostics and the next generation of drugs and the uh, new active ingredients for nets and uh, indoor spraying. I think the second uh, piece though is we need new tools that can help address the extremely high transmission in some settings as well as uh, those uh, settings where the, the nets and, and uh, indoor spraying may not uh, address enough of the transmission where some of the uh, uh, mosquitoes bite outdoors or early in the evening um, or uh, it's an occupational uh, uh, risk. And so I think some of the things in the, in the pipeline such as attracting targeted sugar baits is a clear example of, of addressing a new part of the mosquito's life cycle, which can help to reduce transmission. I think coming out of some of the uh, innovation on COVID, we're actually going to see an acceleration of the uh, 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 progress for developing uh, monoclonals and vaccines for malaria that at, at a higher effectiveness than we've ever uh, seen before, uh, using these new uh, uh, product development uh, uh, pipelines that are that are being spun up for COVID. I think that'll be a good um, uh, second effect. I think we also see real uh, innovation that's needed in terms of data and surveillance. How do you know where you need more? How do you know where you're seeing a surge in cases? How can you do that in a timely way? Not looking a year later and saying, oh, there were a lot of deaths in this country, but uh, cases are on the rise. How can we respond quickly in a way that uh, knocks down malaria fast? And then I think the last th uh, piece of, of where some of the innovations is it's not just new uh, innovations, but new approaches. And I think we know where we have sufficient reduction of transmission, uh, sufficient case management, and good enough surveillance to know where you need more of each, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we can uh, beat malaria. And I think understanding what are the uh, pathways, what are the innovations that are going to get us to better and better case management is, is a key thing that we need to make sure not to overlook. And I think some of the innovations that you've been part of with the Kitakui project, uh, I think some of the work that we're seeing Rotary and Malaria Partners supporting in Zambia and, and in, in Uganda and in other places uh, will pair very nicely with the innovations that we're seeing in new tools uh, that are in the pipeline with the uh, improved state and surveillance and bring all that together to where we can actually drive down the burden and actually get it to zero. Um, I'm sorry that I will have to uh, uh, step off, but it's been a pleasure uh, to uh, uh, be, be with all of you on this panel. Thank you so much, Philip. A pleasure and an honor to have you. Um, just one last question, and, and that is, um, can, uh, for, for Joy, Diane, or Abdu, can you speak to how your organization is currently partnering with Rotary? Um, and. Uh, and, and what might be the future of that, particularly when Rotary, which is currently focused on polio, um, finally sees it eradicated and is able possibly to turn its attention to malaria. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, um, so we have um, been working on a partnership with Rotary for the last two years, um, and we were absolutely delighted to, with Rotary International and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to sort of enter into a partnership with the Rotarians Against Malaria. 
um, as part of our outreach for um, our replenishment last year. Um, and we partnered with um, the Rotarians Against Malaria, who were the principal recipient of our malaria grant in Papua New Guinea. Um, and worked together with them about what, what a fundraising partnership might look like for the Asia Pacific region. Um, so that, their, their mother organization is the Rotary Australia World Community Service. Um, and we've together um, signed an MOU um, to do a, a big fundraising drive um, throughout the Asia Pacific region over the next three years. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, we um, we were able to to partner on a pledge um, in that last replenishment of twelve million dollars, um, which we hope is just the beginning of what will be a long-standing partnership um, for malaria. And I think what's exciting about that is that there really is an elimination agenda in the Asia Pacific region with um, really um, real possibilities of success um, in the next couple of years. So. Um, the, the fundraising there is targeted um, very much at that elimination agenda, um, which really mirrors all of that fabulous work that was done in polio. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great new um, uh, direction. Um, and also, I think what, what feels great about the partnership for us is the Rotarian um, community approach, which is really in the DNA of the Global Fund, that grassroots partnership and community um, which is also the way in which fundraising is done. So I think it, it mirrors nicely um, the way in which we work. And we're pretty excited about that and, and hope to take that global as well. Um, so look forward to other ideas as well about how we could be doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I think we'd like to uh, open up to the audience in our, um, no, I can't say remaining minutes, but in our remaining minutes of, of overtime, this has been an incredibly rich discussion. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I also would just like to thank again our panelists for joining us today um, and all of our attendees from all over the world. Unfortunately, we're at time and we won't have a chance to answer um, the significant amount of audience questions we've received in the Q&A uh, chat box, but we will be uh, compiling all of the questions uh, in a transcript and we'll be sharing uh, with everyone who has uh, joined this call today. Um, so I, I, again, I want to share that if you want further information about Rotary's efforts to eliminate malaria or for the most recent trends in malaria eradication, please visit uh, ramglobal.org or rotarianmalariapartners.org. Uh, and we hope that you're going to join us again for future webinars. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful.